we're going to be talking about C Sharp interfaces and abstract classes. Uh, interface is basically a skeleton of a class. It will include the properties. Uh, it can also include method uh, signatures. It can include events and indexers. Uh, and basically all an indexer is, uh, is it lets you create a class structure or interface that client apps can access like an array. Uh, and we are going to actually be using those in upcoming weeks. Uh, we will also be reviewing properties in upcoming weeks, but uh, that is something that we did learn in the 110 course, uh, the prereq for this class. Uh, I do have a link to that information uh, for those of you who don't remember properties or maybe the uh, 110 course that you took was a while back and it wasn't covered. Uh, so we'll get to that in a minute. Um, a couple things that you need to remember about interfaces is that it allows a method signature, but the method cannot have a body, which means there is no curly brace and there are no uh, statements. So it's just the first line of the method. Uh, the interface does not allow fields but you can create properties, okay? So um, that is kind of how it works around uh, fields. An interface does not contain any constructors because it's basically a skeleton of a class. It is not a, an actual class. Uh, also, interface methods and properties don't have access modifiers because again, it's, it's not an actual class, it's like a skeleton. Um, so what an interface basically does is it tells you what you need to include in a class, but not how to implement it. So interfaces are quite abstract. Um, they are meant to be abstract uh, and it's kind of like a prescription for what you need in your class. Um, one of the reasons that interfaces are used is because you can create a class using multiple interfaces. Um, and if you remember from inheritance, we can only inherit from one base, but we can implement multiple interfaces. So this is kind of the C-sharp uh, workaround for multiple inheritance. In fact, C Sharp allows you to inherit from a base and implement multiple interfaces all in the same derived class. To create an interface uh, has to be public. You use the keyword interface and then you give it a name. And in, in front of the name, you put a capital I. And this is a convention that is used across .NET frameworks. And it is one that we are going to follow because it helps you easily identify in uh, longer programs, you know, what class is implementing an interface versus classes that are being derived from base classes. So um, it's a capital I followed by whatever you want to call your interface. Okay, and then you're going to have your properties, your methods. Um, and again, it's just the method signature and there is no access modifier. And I do have an example here uh, of an interface uh, called iAnimal. Very simple. I've got one property, which is name, and I have one method, which is called describe. And you'll notice at the end of the method signature, I have a semicolon. And that is because the method has no body. Okay. And for those of you who need a refresher on properties, I did include a link 
uh, to the information that we covered in the 110 class. Uh, we will also be talking about properties again in this course in upcoming weeks. So uh, one example, uh, I animal, I do have another, a second example called I employee. And you can see I've got three properties here. And then I've got a couple different methods. So interfaces are pretty basic. <laughs> There's not a lot to them. Uh, and in C Sharp, we implement an interface. We don't derive from it, we implement it. Uh, the syntax is kind of identical <laughs> to uh, how we handle an inheritance. So um, with an interface, you can implement the interface in a class or a structure. Uh, so I do have um, the syntax for both. And if you're creating a new class, obviously it's keyword class followed by the name, a colon, and then your interface name. Okay. And then if you are implementing the interface in a structure, you're going to use the keyword struct, followed by whatever you're going to call your structure, a colon, and the interface name. And so it is always helpful to see examples. So here is the iAnimal interface and the implementation. So I'm creating a class called horse uh, and I'm implement implementing iAnimal. And you can see that when you implement the interface, you do have to give it an access modifier. Okay, so I'm implementing the property here. Um, also, when you implement an interface, you are going to create a constructor, uh, default and parameterized constructor. Uh, then for any method that is in the interface, you actually have to kind of flush it out. Okay, so you take that signature Okay, and you have to add the access modifier. And then you add your curly braces and you add all of the statements to the method. Okay, and so at this point, our horse class operates like any other class. So creating a new object kind of works the same. Um, what is a little unusual, is that um, you can actually create a horse object using the horse class or the interface. So that is a little bit unusual. Here is another example. Uh, and again, I am using an interface and implementing it in a class. Although the information that you're seeing for a class pretty much works the same as uh, structures. So this interface is iEmployee. Now I have three properties and two methods. And so you can see in my worker class, I have to include the three properties that are part of the interface. And then I also included a couple additional properties in this class. So I basically expanded on the interface. Uh, then I created the default and parameterized constructors. And the two methods that were in the interface have to be kind of fleshed out. So um, I created uh, the full name and the double pay methods. Once uh, the worker class has been created, I use it just like any other class.
And here is another example. And this one, I am using an iEvent interface and I am implementing it in a structure. But you can see that it pretty much works the same way as implementing it in a class. And so I have to include the properties and the method, uh, which I did. I've got the method down here. And then I added to it uh, fields and a default and a parameterized constructor. And then the main method kind of works as usual. Now, I mentioned one of the uh, advantages of using an interface is that you can implement multiple interfaces within a single class, um, along with uh, deriving the class from a base. And so this is the C-sharp version of multiple inheritance. So <clears throat> I have an example where I've got two interfaces, iAnimal and iDomestic, and I implement both of those in the horse class. And you can see when you have multiple interfaces, you just put commas between them. So if you implement multiple interfaces, you must include all of the properties from both. Okay? And then you will create a constructor and a parameterized constructor, um, basically initializing all of those properties. And then any method that is in iAnimal or iDomestic I actually have to include in this class and I have to flush them out. Okay, and once the class is created, it operates like any other class. Now you will notice that um, each one, and this is what's a little weird, each one of these has its own little method, okay? And so I fleshed them out here and this is how I call them. Sometimes when you implement multiple in interfaces, um, they can have the same method name. And the way we've been calling our methods is uh, implicit because it looks at the method name and the method name has been unique. So it knows, you know, what the method goes with. Um, if you implement multiple interfaces and they happen to have the same method name, then you have to explicitly specify the name of the interface um, when you are using the method. So here's an example of the issue where I've got two describe methods, okay? And I'm implementing both of these interfaces. So I can't just have one describe method here. I have to have two. Okay, and so I prefix the iAnimal describe with iAnimal.describe, and I prefix the iDomestic with iDomestic.describe. The problem with this is that uh, the properties are not a problem. I can fill those in. No issue there. Um, but if I create a horse object, I cannot call iAnimal or iDomestic describe. In order to use these, I actually have to create an iAnimal horse or an iDomestic horse. Okay, and uh, the iAnimal horse uh, can fill in 
the information that came from iAnimal and it can call the method that came from iAnimal. Uh, and likewise, if I create an iDomestic horse, that horse can fill in the property that came from iDomestic and it can also fill in the describe that came from that method. So what is the workaround for this? Honestly, I would probably create my own uh, describe method, although I would not call it describe. Um, and then I would just simply use that. I, that would be my workaround. So that is the lowdown on interfaces. Uh, now we're going to move on to abstract classes. Now remember, an interface can be implemented by a class or structure. And now we're moving on to abstract classes. And because we're dealing with a class, then it can only be derived. Uh, and you can only create uh, a new class through inheritance. And an abstract class is basically designed to be inherited from. Okay, um, so when you create an abstract class, you cannot uh, use this in your program and create objects from it. Okay, it is solely designed to be used as a base class. And so uh, you put the keyword abstract in front of class and your class name. And inside the class, all of your properties have to be abstract. Uh, and all the methods have to be abstract. Um, but you can also include non-abstract methods. Okay, and abstract methods do not have bodies. Okay, similar to how we had to do the methods in an interface. Non-abstract methods are complete methods. Okay, they have bodies. Okay, abstract methods, the ones without the bodies, have to be overridden. But the non-abstract ones, because they do have a body, they do not have to be overridden. Okay, so this is kind of like a, a blueprint for your class. Um, and for maybe uh, difficult methods, you may want to provide code uh, to help people out who will be um, using the class uh, to derive a new one. Okay, and so uh, key things to remember, abstract classes, methods, and properties have to be public, um, and they must include the keyword abstract. An abstract class, can have both abstract methods and non-abstract methods. An abstract class can contain abstract properties and abstract properties have to be overridden in the derived class and an abstract class must be inherited from. You cannot create an object from an abstract class. Any class can be abstract, um, even a class where uh, you have derived a class from a base, that derived class can be abstract. So um, here is the first example. Uh, and I, since we're familiar with animal, we looked at it as an interface, I have now made it an abstract class. And so you'll notice I have the keyword abstract. Uh, for the name property, I added abstract. And then for describe, I also added abstract. What is not abstract is the fully defined what am I method. Okay. So when you derive a new class from animal, you have to override the properties and you have to override the abstract methods. 
but you do not have to override the what am I method because it's fully defined. So let's take a look at our horse class. In the horse class, how you derive from an abstract class is the same way as you derive from any class, okay? at least in uh, the first statement. Every property that you're gonna override, you have to put the keyword override in. Every method that you are going to override also requires the keyword override. And then your apps, your derived class is also going to need constructors. Okay, so you can see I have overridden the name property and I've actually created a type property. And then I have overridden the describe method. And you'll notice that I did not override what am I? Because I can use what am I as is. It is a public method. So it's automatically part of my horse class. And so in my main method, creating a horse object, um, I add the data for the name and the type, and then I can call what am I? And that goes back up here because this is a fully defined method. It's not abstract. And then um, I can also call describe which is overridden here. And remember, when you use the override keyword, it makes that method virtual. So in the future, if I want to derive a class from horse, maybe I wanna do pony or a specific type of horse, um, if I wanted to override this, I can, okay? Because this override, uh, that keyword makes this virtual. Uh, programming example two, I have taken uh, the employee interface and converted it into an abstract class. So you can see I've got my abstract properties. And I have a method that is not abstract, full name. And then I have an abstract method called double pay. And the reason I made that abstract is because, um, you know, people get paid in different ways. So if you're going to create a new class from this, you might want people to have salaries. You might want people to be hourly. You may want people to... Uh, have a piece rate pay. Okay, so uh, lots of different ways to pay people. So what I did was I derived a class worker from employee. I had to override the three properties that were abstract. Plus I added my own rate and hours. And then I created the default and parameterized constructors. And I had to override pay because that was an abstract method, okay? And so this is hourly workers. So I calculate a salary for overtime and a regular pay. Okay, and then you can see I've got just a couple examples. I've got one using the parameterized constructor. I've got one using the default constructor and then assigning values. So by default, inheritance, uh, interfaces, abstract classes are all designed to be modified uh, during inheritance or implementation. But what if you have a class that you don't want to serve as a base? You don't want another class to inherit from it. Or what if you have a class and it's okay to inherit from the class, but there is a method that you don't want brought over into the new class. So you don't want that inherited. You can control uh, what is inherited uh, by using a keyword sealed. A sealed class 
means that it is the last one in the line. You cannot derive a new class from it. A sealed method means that while you can derive a new class, that method is not going to come along. And you can't override it. So uh, let us take a look at an example of how we might create a sealed class. And I should mention that a sealed class, you can only really add the sealed modifier if you have a situation of inheritance. So here I've got an interface I employee that I've implemented in an employee class. And you'll notice that my employee class doesn't add anything new. It just kind of fleshes out the interface. Okay, then I have created worker and worker is derived from employee. And if I don't want anything derived from worker, I can add sealed to the front. So this is the last in the line. Okay, and you can see that I have created a couple additional properties. And I have the constructor initializing them and calling the base. I've got the parameterized constructor doing the same thing. And then I have overridden the pay. Because if you look up here, uh, the pay for employee was salary. That's not what I wanted here. Okay, so that is an example of uh, sealing a class. Now, in addition, if you have an unsealed class, but you don't want a method overridden, you can seal the method. So in this little example, uh, it's kind of the same as we were looking at before. I've got my iEmployee interface, and I implement that in employee. And I don't add anything new. I just kind of flush out the interface. Okay, And then I derive worker from employee. And what I really don't want is for them to override the pay, because this is for hourly workers. So I went ahead and sealed that. Now, this will allow another class to derive from worker, uh, they'll be able to add to it. They will be able to call all of these base methods, but they cannot override pay. So that is the only thing they won't be able to do. Okay, And then again, here is an example uh, of how the main method is using it. And you'll notice that I create not just worker objects, I'm actually creating an employee object here as well. Now, I encourage you to take these examples, copy them, paste them into Visual Studio and run them. And then you can make changes to them uh, and kind of play around with this and see how it all works.